Hello, everybody, again, and welcome to the webinar on European identity and the Europe of the peoples. After, <clears throat> at the 1973 Copenhagen European Summit, the heads of government of the enlarged European community affirmed their determination to introduce the concept of European identity into their common foreign relations. In the Declaration on European Identity, it was stated that uh, the nine wish to ensure that the cherished values of their legal, political, and moral order are respected and preserve the rich variety of their national cultures. Sharing as they do the same attitude to life, they are determined to defend the principles of representative democracy, of the rule of law, of social justice, and of respect for human rights. All of these are fundamental elements of the European identity. This declaration is fully consistent with the dream of the founders of the European project. They dreamed of a united Europe, a continent of peace, solidarity, and shared prosperity, evolving towards an ever closer union among the countries of Europe. About 50 years after this declaration, the pandemic first and the current geopolitical crisis have given a new impulse to the process of European integration. But the European Union should firstly be a European Union of the peoples. And we, as Europeans, who are we? This webinar digs into this issue, focusing on European cultural identity as developed since the Enlightenment as a time-honored conception of humanity, a conception of man as a rational animal created in the image of God. In the first part of this webinar, Simon Glendinning, head of the European Institute and professor of European philosophy at the London School of Economics and Political Science, starting from Nietzsche's conception of the human being, will reflect on the fundamental challenges to the European heritage of democracy that are posed by our time and the future of European politics that has so far understood itself in terms of the idea of ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. This webinar then focuses on a crucial hindrance to achieving this ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, that is the language heterogeneity across the European states. While many want to entertain the idea that there are three procedural languages for the EU apparatus, English, French, and German, what is taking place not only in the EU, but also in a vast number of domains across mainland Europe, is that English is the dominant tongue when people meet who have different linguistic profile. One consequence here is that English is no longer a foreign language in mainland Europe, but rather a second language. In the second part of this webinar, Marco Modiano, professor in English studies at Yavle University, will then argue that the solution to this procedural conundrum could be recognizing English as the working language of the EU. This could then set the stage for establishing a European English rendition of the language to become a good basis for teaching English and learning across the member states of the European Union. Uh, we will then close this webinar view with a Q&A session. We will also have a, a, a short Q&A uh, session after each, uh, each talk. Without further ado, San Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, I'm going to be stopping your screen and sharing one of my own. Here we go. And you can tell me, Claudio, when it will, Marco, you can see that. Okay. So uh, this title, The Meaning of Europe and the Meaning of Man, man is a difficult word still to use today, but um, for a long time in Europe, a word man or corresponding to man will have been the general way we talk about human beings and uh, uh, it's that rather archaic form that I'll be looking at initially at least um, but this combination the meaning of Europe and the meaning of man um, is uh, my theme today and my basic claim is that the two these two the two meanings as it were have been profoundly entangled with each other uh, each implying the other in a certain way 
And uh, to help think about that entanglement, I will do little more actually than uh, dispatch to you a series of postcards sent out by other people that I've sort of put together to try to give you a picture of this connection and this entanglement and to point the way towards uh, uh, an understanding of this relationship that might belong to us today. So here's the first postcard. Uh, it was sent out independently by two different people, which is quite remarkable. They're certainly not the only two people who, to have said something like this, but two thinkers of the 20th century, uh, the French um, poet and essayist Paul Valéry and uh, the uh, uh, British-based philosopher Isaiah Berlin, um, both said, uh, now it's not moving, Let's see. Here we go. All politics imply a certain idea of man. Now, in, in my own work, I've tried to demonstrate the fundamental role in the formation of European cultural identity and in Europe's politics of just such an idea of man, a distinctive understanding of what it means to be the living thing that we are, whatever that is, an anthropology at the basis of our self-understanding. And um, my suggestion is that that anthropology comes down to us from two sources, from uh, Greek antiquity, uh, from the Greek philosophical conception of the human being as the zoon logon echon. Now, uh, that is, means uh, the living thing, the zoon, the living thing with the capacity for the logos. Uh, a logos, a word meaning roughly word. Although what this logos word means and has been understood to mean uh, is actually a central part of the unfolding European story as well. Most significantly and faithfully, when zoon, logon, echon, was translated into the Latin of the Roman Republic as animal rationale. I'll come back to that. But the second source is from the Bible, from the theological conception of man presented in the text of Genesis, where it's written, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So man on that conception is uniquely the ens creatum, the created thing that is made in the image of God, the imago Dei. Now, when and where the, as it were, logocentric anthropology of antiquity, the zoon, logon, ekon, is appropriated into the theomorphic anthropology of biblical Christianity, the Imago Dei, there we see the formation of a distinctively European understanding of man, where the humanity of man is understood as theomorphic rational animality. Theomorphic, the made in the image of God, rational animality, with the rational, rational side there uh, being the uh, translation, the appropriative translation of Logos. Man, on that conception, when you think of man as a theomorphic rational being, uh, man is then understood as a being with a history. The unfolding in time of man's being towards an end time, an eschaton in the Christian language, that would be the realization of its proper end, its telos. So an eschaton and a telos, an eschaton as the end time and the telos as the end towards which we're heading. And this kind of conception of the human is given a very nice summary in another short postcard here from uh, the French, Algerian born French philosopher Jacques Derrida summarizing that tradition, eschatology and teleology, that is man. So two conceptions, as it were, of the, of 
of the temporal order of man's being uh, moving towards an end time and this moving towards an end. But this idea of man sketches also a basic idea of Europe. And it's summarized here, in my next postcard from uh, Emmanuel Levinas, a Lithuanian born French philosopher. Europe is the Bible and the Greeks. So we have these uh, two sources of our self understanding from Greek antiquity and from uh, biblical texts, giving us a conception of man as this historical being unfolding in time towards an end. But those conceptions together, the conceptions of ourselves particularly that one finds in the Bible and in Greek antiquity, this Levinas suggests is Europe. The European space is the space of that self-understanding. Europe itself then uh, unfolds in the space opened up by Greek philosophy and biblical Christianity especially, the site of the unfolding of the understanding of ourselves as man understood like this, where man, the being we ourselves are, is understood in terms of the historical development of man towards some kind of ultimate destiny. But Europe is not simply the place where history is understood in terms of the emancipation or de-alienation or self-realization of theomorphic rational animality. Europe belongs to the history that it projects and it places itself at the head of that history, at the front, as the avant-garde of, of world humanity in this movement of man towards an end. Europe presents itself to itself as that part of humanity that has broken from primitive or originally traditional customs and forms of life and has entered a new historical stage, not a regionally particular way to be, but a universally rational and scientific culture that best represents and exemplifies rational life en route towards its end. This would be Europe's modern promise, the promise of Europe's modernity. Well, in view with this idea of man, this distinctively European idea of man and history is what is called universal history a Greco-Biblical or teleo-eschatological or with the Greek concern with uh, being, ontos, and the religious concern with the theological and ontotheological or even ontotheoteleological history of humanity as a movement towards an end, towards the end time of attained human perfection. This is what's in view in the idea of a universal history. Now that idea of a history as a universal history, as a, a movement towards perfection, was perhaps most famously proposed by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant in a short text written in 1784 entitled the idea of a universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. Now Kant's essay outlined a philosophical vision of human history based on the idea of human life as the life of the uh, God created rational animal. It was a vision of great progress of, for, for humanity towards a fully rational form of life, a life that promised peace, freedom, and well-being for all humanity, with Europe at the head of the pack in that development. It's a conception that's still with us today 
in the idea of a cosmopolitical project of European Union, heading towards ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. In 1784, Kant projected that project himself in words that are in fact inscribed in the institutions of the European Union that are with us today. Well, let's have a quick look at, at Kant's prediction. Kant's prediction in 1784 of the emergence of the European Union in his own words. It's rather long, I'll read it out, but here's the quote. Let's sort of shift my picture. The effects which an upheaval in any state as a result of war produces upon all the others in our continent, where all are so closely linked by trade, are so perceptible that these other states are forced by their own insecurity to offer themselves as arbiters, albeit without legal authority, so that they indirectly prepare the way for a great political body of the future without precedence in the past. Although this political body exists for the present only in the roughest of outlines, it nonetheless seems as if a feeling is beginning to stir in all its members, each of which has an interest in maintaining the whole. And this encourages the hope that after many revolutions, the highest purpose of nature a universal cosmopolitan existence will at last be realized as the matrix within which all the original capacities of the human race may develop. First in Europe, the great political body of the future. It would be an institutional framework through which Europe would transform itself from a condition of war into one of peace. And in so doing, Kant thought that Europe will be providing a model and an example for the whole world. Well, has Europe's modern history provided the example, the best example of the development of all the original capacities of the human race? Well, Emmanuel Levinas, who gave us our first summary introduction to European identity with his formula, Europe is the Bible and the Greeks, also provides us with a fitting summary of its real modern condition. And again, there's quite a long quote here, and again, I'll read it out. That history of peace, freedom, and well being promised on the basis of a light that a universal knowledge projected onto the world even unto the religious messages that sought justification for themselves in the truths of knowledge, that history, that's, he's talking about universal history, that history is not recognizable in its millennia of fratricidal struggle, political or bloody, of imperialism, scorn and exploitation of the human being, down to our century of world wars, the genocides of the Holocaust and terrorism, unemployment and continual desperate poverty of the third world, ruthless doctrines and cruelty of fascism and national socialism, right down to the supreme paradox of the defense of man and his rights being perverted into Stalinism. Hence the challenge to the centrality of Europe and its culture, a worn out Europe. Well, we today, have our lives, including our political lives, in the ruins of this worn out Europe. Our time is above all, as Samuel Beckett put it, the time of a time-honored conception of humanity in ruin. Well, what becomes of man in the ruins of old Europe? Perhaps Nietzsche saw it best, or perhaps or at first. Let's took a, take a quick look at Nietzsche's thinking about what might give our existence the kind of meaningful character we would still most like it to have, namely a final end or goal of history, 
in which we ourselves play the starring role, we ourselves the center of significance. Here's Nietzsche on this. This meaning could have been the fulfillment of some highest ethical canon in all events, the moral world order, or the growth of love and harmony in the intercourse of being, or the gradual approximation of a state of universal happiness, or even the development towards a state of universal annihilation. Any goal at least constitutes some meaning. What all these notions have in common is that something is to be achieved through the process. And now one realizes that becoming aims at nothing and achieves nothing. Nietzsche actually wants us cheerfully to welcome the new conclusively transitory character of our condition, the condition we're beginning to see as our own. From now on, there is no longer any future for conceiving man as the collaborator, he says, or let alone the center of becoming or history. Existence has no goal or end, says Nietzsche. Well, if not part of a movement of a universal history towards such an end or goal, how might our modernity best be understood? Nietzsche talks famously of our time as the time of the death of God. However, Nietzsche conceives that time as inseparable from what he calls the process of democratization in Europe. It's the time of the coming to dominance of Democrats, their, what he calls their democratic taste and their modern ideas of great progress. Well, most people today would regard this, not unreasonably, I think, as basically a good thing to have those democratic ideas of progress and so on. Well, Nietzsche is ambivalent. On the one hand, he regarded the processes of democratization in Europe as in any case, he says, a completely resistless force, a resistless force, and something it would be literally pointless to resist. However, what he sees in the unfolding historical reality of this democratic movement in Europe is the spreading out of a version of democracy that he found deeply problematic. It was a process that was transforming Europeans into what he called stunted little animals and herd animals. And yet, for Nietzsche, it is not all over for Europe, or in fact, for democracy. The leveling mediocrity, as he sees it, of modern democratic ideas may be increasingly our reality. But that very historical reality has within itself, he thinks, and not simply opposed to it, but in itself, beyond itself, a democratic desire that can be identified within it, that is the other of its modern formation, but one that Nietzsche wants to champion. In a text from 1880, so we're now uh, nearly 100 years on from Kant, in a text from 1880 entitled The Wanderer and His Shadow, Nietzsche articulates his conception of democracy in a way that does sound exactly the opposite of a herd animal society. In the language of the attainable and of the possible, politics as the art of the possible, Nietzsche gives us, I believe, the best and most fitting political words for democracy. The aim, he says, to create and guarantee for each in the all, as much independence as possible in their opinions, way of life, and occupation. This is something he affirms as a foundation for a new European culture that's been genuinely freed from what Kant had called our self-imposed immaturity, 
but now freed too from uh, the conception of man which had guided us hitherto. But now when Nietzsche speaks about this democracy, he affirms it in a distinctive futural way. When he speaks of a democratic order in this threefold sense, as much independence as possible in opinions, way of life, occupations. He speaks, he says, of democracy as something to come. At issue with this Nietzschean conception of a democracy to come would be a social setup, uh, uh, what one might think of as a mighty politico economic order that wants to get along without the idea of the attainability of a final distant goal of human perfection. It's a politics freed from all teleology, freed from the idea that it aims at the becoming actual of the rational potential in man as the old ontotheological conception of man and history would have had it. Well, some may feel without that kind of messianic hope for such an arrival at the end, without faith in a final end of history to come, we're left standing still, nowhere to go, left at the starting line. But doing without the idea of a final end is precisely perhaps what can give us strength and speed here and now for the stress and strain of being the conclusively transitory, unpre unpredictably self-transforming animal that we are. The adventure of human life, as Valerie called it, is a voyage without end. It's not on the way to attaining a definite result that we might presently anticipate as its final completion, completion accomplishment, or end. And that for Nietzsche, as indeed for Valerie and for Berlin, is good. It's simply good, more fitting, more humane than the ontotheological understanding that we've inherited hitherto. Nietzsche's democracy as something yet to come projects an ideal way in which we might be with respect to which a contemporary perfectionist interest in emancipation and progress might take its bearing. And yet it's resolutely non-utopian. So it wants, as it were, to create and guarantee something. That's its ambition. It's a, a striving towards something that we haven't attained. So it is, as it were, has this perfectionist interest for us. But it's resolutely non-utopian in the sense that it, what it does not project or promise or hope for is a final end of perfectionist ambition. So if you think about the old story of the end of history, when you reach the end, that's it. It's all done. There's no more perfectionist ambition to have. Nietzsche's conception doesn't have that shape. It is itself a perfectionist ambition to create and guarantee this, but it's an odd one. It stands as an ideal, as a yet to be attained, but attainable condition, to use Emerson's formulation. But this perfectionism says nothing whatsoever about what perfectionist ambition might belong to such a world. It says nothing whatsoever about what it's like to be alive there. It says nothing whatsoever about what people there will have, as Isaiah Berlin put it, what they found to be indispensable to their life as unpredictably self-transforming beings. This is simply unpredictable, beyond knowledge, and we shouldn't want to predict anything here either. In short, this perfectionist project of Nietzsche's projects a way in which we might be, but without projecting any specific way in which we might be. Jack Derrida will call this a messianism without determinate messianism. 
the American philosopher Stanley Cavell will call it perfectionism democratized. It's a perfectionism which affirms the possibility that attaining an as yet unattained condition is to be conceived as always possible, never over. So what's projected here as anything one might call a completed democracy is, Cavell suggests, for example, one that maximizes the chance in every here and now for each to take a step towards an unattained possibility of the self. As an ideal, it takes no position at all on anyone's position, only that there should be this optimization of the as much as possible condition in Nietzsche's threefold sense. In contrast to conceptions that project an ideal end of complete democratic development, the kind of complete democracy envisaged here is essentially open-ended. It is, as Cavell puts it, an open-ended thematics of perfectionism entirely without essential definition and radically opposed to a sense of a final or perfected state that each is to attain or pursue. In the complete democracy to come, democracy itself remains to be thought. It is, as it were, part of the perfectionist movement of perfectionism, to perfectionism democratized that democracy itself can become a theme for thinking of what would be attaining uh, an as yet unattained condition for itself. So complete democracy is essentially incomplete, open-ended, without end. And it's for this reason that when Derrida speaks of democracy and its ideal concept, he speaks of it as an essentially elliptical expression democracy for him in its every here and now remains to be thought. Democracy is democracy to come. And this is Derrida on this. The expression democracy to come takes into account the absolute and intrinsic historicity of the only system that welcomes in itself, in its very concept, that expression of autoimmunity that's uh, self-destroying, that expression of autoimmunity called the right to self-critique and perfectibility, whence its charm and its fragility. But in order for this historicity, unique among all political systems, to be complete, it must be freed from all teleology, all onto-theo-teleology. It must be freed, in other words, from that conception of man and history that has been uh, handed down to us. Democracy is the only political system on this conception that calls for its own critique, admits to its own revisability, and its openness to challenge in its present, let's say past created, institutional or constitutional and legal setup. Here, autoimmunity, self-destroying becomes through self-critique, destroying as it were where you were, uh, becomes a source of endless perfectibility rather than suicide. Although unfortunately, the latter is never excluded. Suicide as it were on part of a democracy is part of what it is to be a democracy. But what exposes democracy to that threat of its death is also what gives it its life its chance. Well, what of European Union in all this and its perfectibility as a project of integration, seeking ever closer union among the peoples of Europe? Well, running the irresistible program of the process of democratization of Europe into a future projection, Nietzsche made a prediction too. He predicted first the emergence in Europe of an increasingly dominant and prosperous middle class, a class with more interest, he says, in novelty 
and experiment than it had piety for historical memory for the old nation state. And in that context of a transformed sense of national identity and national belonging, and a weakened sense of the old national rivalries in Europe, the next practical result of European democratization, Nietzsche predicted, uh, would be the development of political preferences that would, as he puts it, inseparably connect home and foreign politics in Europe, for the nations of Europe, in a way that would make the former home politics less beholden to destructive upheavals from the latter, from foreign politics. In what might be called, institutionally speaking, a kind of old model Swissification of Europe, Nietzsche too, almost exactly a hundred years after Kant, predicted the formation of a European Union. It would be, he says, a European League of Nations within which each individual nation, delimited by the proper geographical frontiers, has the position of a canton with its separate rights. Well, Nietzsche is among those who anticipated the coming into being of what today is making its way in the form of the European Union. But unlike Kant, this is now freed from all teleology. The ever closer union among the peoples of Europe is no longer conceived as a heading towards a rational telos in the idea of a kind of uh, completed um, federal superstate, a great republic, or a European government, but has the form, as, as a matter of fact Kant himself predicted it ultimately would have, of something like a permanent congress or federation or league of free states, each with its separate rights. A united Europe of states that could create and guarantee for each member as much independence as possible in the domain of its separate rights, a union that thus seeks to maximize the ongoing preservation and enhancement of each in the all, a united Europe of states, not a kind of United States of Europe where one size fits all. Well, that preference in the politics of European integration, where union is conceived as enhancing rather than limiting or even eliminating the freedom of its members, was of course the long-standing British preference for Europe too. In the course of the Brexit referendum, this came to a head when the then British Prime Minister David Cameron made a last ditch attempt to negotiate what was going to be called a new settlement for Britain in Europe. And he very nearly won what might have been a significant change, not just for Britain, but for the whole union. The draft agreement between Cameron and the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, presented on the 2nd of February 2016, included the following text, the text agreed to by Tusk and Cameron on sovereignty. One, references in the treaties and their preambles to the process of creating an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe are primarily intended to signal that the union's aim is to promote trust and understanding among peoples living in open and democratic societies, sharing a common heritage of universal values. Uh, Claudio almost uh, <laughs> cited this, uh, not, not knowing it was going to appear here. However, it continues, they are not an equivalent to the objective of political integration. Well, that text, that rather extraordinary text, uh, that Tusk and Cameron put together did not make it into the final agreement on the 19th of February 2016. It was rejected, in fact, by the European Parliament. That This text that you can see here was uh, replaced with an extremely bizarre proposal that the EU treaties be amended, quote, so as to make it clear that the references to ever closer union do not apply to the United Kingdom. Well, the draft text of 
section C may not have given Cameron what he needed to win the referendum in Britain. Perhaps nothing would have given him that. But its replacement, this the strangest of all UK EU opt-outs, was a totally unconvincing variation. And it was a variation that only served to confirm that the old teleological form of words on ever closer union were also very, very jealously guarded words for those who still wanted them to signal a supranational federal state-like condition as the accomplished end or goal of political integration in Europe, and not on the books as the draft section C would have had it as something definitively and explicitly not equivalent to that. Well, of course, uh, Brexit referendum came and went and Britain had to leave. And Britain now has to work its way out of the other side of Brexit and has to come to terms with the fact that there is an inverse relationship between sovereignty and independence in a globalized world. The more one attains of the former, sovereignty, the less one can navigate freely in the latter. Independence in a globalized world is reduced with the increase of sovereignty for the, such a state. Nevertheless, Britain is not alone with its paradoxes and problems. And I very much doubt that what is often conceived today as the distinctively British idea of a united Europe of states, as opposed to a United States of Europe, will disappear from European politics in the now Britain-free EU. Speaking in Warsaw in 2003, the then British Prime Minister of Britain, Tony Blair, was, I think, right on this. We want a union of nations, not a federal superstate, and that vision is shared by the majority of countries and people in Europe. Well, I don't believe that the future of the EU lies in the hands of federalist visionaries in Europe's supranational institutions, visionaries still too captivated by a rational vision of ever closer union conceived on the old teleological model. It lies in the hands of the EU's constituent countries and especially the millions of their voters, the people of the Europe of people. Nietzsche affirmed a democratic political regime as one that wants and tries to create and guarantee for its citizens as much independence as possible in their opinions, way of life and occupation. The principle is exactly the same for the member states of Europe's union. The whole Pacific point of the EU on this conception is to protect and not replace and reduce the power of its member states. As again, Tony Blair put it in his Warsaw speech, the purpose of the European Union is to give us, the individual nations that form it, greater economic and political strength. An EU which enabled its members to cooperate in our mutual interests would ward off, he said, Euroscepticism by practically demonstrating that in collective co cooperation, they increase individual strength. So Blair writing at that time, hoping to ward off Euroscepticism. He was of course accused in just arguing this point of how it being a Euroskeptic skeptic himself of being not on side of the project. Well, I think that's absolutely not, but it is certainly not on side with the, as it were, the teleological vision of ever close to union. Now, this British preference that Blair states here, a long pedigree in British politics, as I've written about elsewhere. But I'll give you one closing quote to show quite how far back it goes to 1859 and the philosopher John Stuart Mill, who uh, in his text On Liberty, outlined a picture of Europe, which I think um, is very much part of the fabric of uh, British thinking about Europe but I will always emphasize that this British thinking is not simply British. So here's Mill, our last long quote, which I'll read out to you. 
What has hitherto preserved Europe from becoming a stationary culture like China, he said in his time. Not any superior excellence in the European family, which when it exists, exists as the effect, not as the cause, but their remarkable diversity of character and culture. Individuals, classes, nations have been extremely unlike each other. They have struck out a great variety of paths, each leading to something valuable. And although at every period, those who traveled in different paths have been extremely intolerant of one another, and each would have thought it an excellent thing if all the rest would have been compelled to travel his road. Their attempts to thwart each other's development have rarely had any permanent success, and each has in time endured to receive the good which the others have offered. Europe is, in my judgment, wholly indebted to this plurality of paths for its progressive and many-sided development. To create and guarantee for each in the all as much independence as possible in their opinions, way of life and occupation. Could that possibly be better as a basic principle for our democratic ambitions, national or international, whether it concerns citizens or states? I find it hard not to think that in our today, it is and it remains best. Thank you very much. I'll stop my share there. Claudio, back to you if you want to take a few questions before we move on to Marco. Yes, yes indeed. So I open the floor for questions. Okay, so just a, a quick question. Um, the, the pandemic first and, and geopolitical crisis uh, now have boosted European uh, integration projects, or at least these uh, appears. So what do you think are the key obstacles uh, towards uh, a true progress in, in the attainment of this uh, ever closer union of uh, European countries? Well, thank you, uh, Claudio. I think uh, one of the most interesting developments that I've and of course, I'm now a kind of insider outsider, uh, a European person um, living outside the Union. Uh, but watching it from this inside outside position, uh, I think uh, the most important development I've seen is with the re election of Macron and uh, his statement on the future of uh, the European project. One of the things that I thought most notable in that, in terms of uh, transforming the uh, trajectory of its development would be to uh, affirm, explicitly to affirm, the idea of what he calls a multi-speed Europe. It's not all at once, all in one direction, all at one time. There are countries which want to do certain things more together. There are other countries that do not want to do all these things all at once and all together. And he's saying this is a completely compatible with a project of ever closer union, because ever closer union shouldn't in any case mean movement to one overarching European government or European uh, federal state. And one of the things that I thought most interesting in that multi-speed vision was one which encouraged the possibility, and I'm, I apologize profusely for being so self-interested, but it, it opened the possibility for the UK to rejoin a kind of uh, peripheral institution of the European Union on this multi-speed model. And I think that uh, unless the Union and its politics takes into account these kind of variations inside itself, then there is no real future for uh, European integration. And so I was very pleased personally to see such an ambitious and uh, thoughtful proposal coming from the French president. Okay, I don't think I don't see uh, questions uh, coming now. So maybe we can move to the next part of the webinar. Then we uh, have the the general Q and A session. Very yeah. good. Okay, Marco. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking you, uh, Claudio, for uh, this invitation and for the to the uh, institutions which you represent. Uh, my name is Marco Modiano. I work at Yavli University in Sweden. Uh, I'm a dual national, also an American. And uh, the perspective which I'm going to present uh, in our talk today is pragmatic and based in applied linguistics. So it doesn't have the uh, political dimension of the speech which we have just uh, witnessed. And my uh, goals with uh, presenting this material is to map out the probabilities and possibilities for languages which are competing in Europe um, as major European lingua francas. And perhaps the, 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 at the end of the talk, it will be apparent that uh, both French and German are fighting an uphill battle and will not be able to challenge English as the most common language used in the European Union apparatus, as well as among the peoples of the European Union. Uh, to make this point, I feel that it is beneficial to take a look at the development of multilingualism and, and, and plurilingualism in Europe, um, beginning with a 50 or even longer, 100 year perspective. So if we, if we go back, um, uh, uh, say 100 years, and look at uh, the languages which people were speaking in Europe, um, first of all, we have uh, what we refer to as the L1, uh, or the mother tongue. And there we have not seen such great changes. We certainly have new languages coming into Europe from North Africa and the Middle East. But generally speaking, we've not seen any big change when it comes to the L1, the mother tongue. On the other hand, um, we have seen radical differences in the use of the first additional language, which would be then the L2. Uh, and this in turn then has an effect on plurilingualism on the second additional language or the L3. And if we, you know, all of us have a, idea in our minds of the map of Europe, so we don't have to put that up. Um, but if we, if we look at the map of Europe and, and break it into four conceptualizations, so we have Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, and then we have another idea uh, of Western Europe. Uh, and so uh, that idea of Western Europe, perhaps we could imagine that as uh, countries that belong to NATO, um, and then we would want to include uh, countries like Austria uh, and Norway and so on. So we have this idea of, of four general geographical regions. Now, if we begin uh, in Northern Europe, in uh, the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries and Finland, um, here uh, it was very clear that German had become an important first additional language. Um, up until 1940, uh, increasing numbers of people uh, in Scandinavia in, in the Nordic countries were learning German. Now, uh, French did not have a, a, a prominent position here. Um, if we look at Finland, uh, that's a, a special case, if you will. Finland is a bilingual country where we have a mi minority, uh, which are native speakers of Swedish. And Swedish uh, was and is a, a, a language which people pursue in education. So um, it could very well be the case then that Finnish people that were pursuing higher education were plurilingual. They were learning uh, uh, first Swedish and then after Swedish, they were pursuing German. Uh, there were of course uh, examples of people learning French and so on, but the numbers are not very significant. Uh, if we look at Eastern Europe 100 years ago, uh, what we find there uh, again is uh, German, uh, more, much more so than French. Uh, and this as well continued up until uh, 1945, 1950. Uh, in Southern Europe, it was more common for people to pursue French. Uh, and this idea of Western Europe, if you will, 
Uh, there you have both French and German. Uh, in countries like the Netherlands, you have uh, many people who are plurilingual uh, in French and German. Now, all of this, as we all know, uh, changed radically as a result of uh, World War II. So if we just move a few years forward and look at uh, what was happening in Europe in 1950, uh, there uh, we see very clearly that uh, the interest in German in Northern Europe disappeared almost overnight, and uh, uh, people turned instead to English, not to French. Uh, and this has continued, of course, up until the current time. So it is now the case that the vast majority of people living in, in Scandinavia are at least bilingual and fluent in English. Uh, this is uh, especially the case among young people as much as more than 95% of Swedish children can speak English. If we look then at Eastern Europe, we see Russian uh, coming in with, uh, with uh, uh, the Soviet Union dominating the Warsaw Pact countries, the Cold War, uh, and Russian became uh, the language which people pursued in education and German had to take a back seat. Uh, in Southern Europe, things remain pretty much the same. In Western Europe, uh, we see after 1950, an increase in the number of people who pursue proficiency in English. Now, the next historical moment, if you will, uh, would be uh, uh, 1990, 1991, where we have the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, there, Russian more or less uh, disappeared uh, from Eastern Europe and people began pursuing English. Uh, and uh, in general, if we look at English as, or Europe as a whole, we have uh, people turning away from traditional first additional languages and pursuing English. So this um, has resulted in um, a, an expected bilingualism among young people in the European Union. That is to say, uh, it's becoming extremely common for young people to be proficient in their native language plus English. This is more so uh, in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe, more so in Northern Europe than in Eastern Europe. But it is now the case that all children in school in the European Union have English as a mandatory subject. And because of this, uh, the expectation is that the percentage of the population which is proficient in English will only increase going forward, while plurilingualism uh, looks as if it's going to decrease. At, at the current time, about 38% of the European Union has English uh, and 20% uh, of the European Union is plurilingual. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, is on the agenda for our discussions today is the idea of a European identity. And uh, the goals of the European Union, as we all know, have been to promote linguistic diversity. At the same time, uh, as we see very clearly that one particular language, English, is becoming the most commonly used language, both within the European Union apparatus and among people uh, in general. And this is going on throughout Europe. So uh, if we are going to entertain then the idea that there will be a, a universal language in Europe, a lingua franca, uh, which is actually the case today, but not officially recognized. But if we were, if we were to entertain that thought, then the logical conclusion is of course, that European identity and European integration will take place in the English medium. And that is what I want to address uh, uh, in my talk. I want to address the fact that uh, the idea of a European identity, or if you will, the, a, a European integration, um, which I very much support, um, appears to be something which is going to take place in English. Now, um, we must not forget that the main site of identity and the main site of belonging takes place in the mother tongue. Um, there's no reason to assume that that is going to change. 
Um, and so what we're talking about is the idea of a multicultural Europe, the idea of cross-cultural communication, um, the idea of a recognized lingua franca. And it is already the case today that we have that in place. Um, English is the lingua franca of the European Union. It is the lingua franca of the European Union apparatus. Uh, but it seems to be the case that people are very reluctant to discuss this openly. Uh, one of the reasons being that there is um, an idea uh, among the French that now because of Brexit, uh, French is going to become a more important language, not only in the European Union, but also in Europe. So I want to address uh, the statistics and the probabilities of uh, the rise of French. And I want to explain um, what this then means for other uh, large, uh, large European languages. So first of all, uh, Europe has about 450 million people. And the large uh, languages, of course, are German, uh, French, and Italian. And those uh, three languages uh, are a big, big part of the European Union. We also have uh, other larger European languages, such as Spanish and Polish. Uh, and this has, you know, this has made it difficult, if you will, to continue to conceive uh, German and French as having, as having a special role, if you will. Um, it was perhaps possible to support that, the idea of three procedural languages. It was perhaps possible to support that earlier, but it is becoming increasingly difficult. So um, if we go back to the French and their challenge, if you will, um, the, the, the French are actually a rather small uh, community of L2 users. There are very few L2 users of French in Northern Europe and in Eastern Europe. And you have in Northern Europe and Eastern Europe many smaller languages. Uh, you have um, um, Finnish, Swedish, Danish, uh, uh, and so on. And across the Baltic countries where you have languages that are only spoken by a few million people, there you have a predominance of English as an L2. And the same can be said from Poland all the way down into Bulgaria in Eastern Europe. Um, you have uh, primarily people who are uh, proficient in, in languages such as English, Russian and German, uh, and English would come, or French, if you will, would come after that. So uh, what would be needed uh, to, to be convincing if we wanted to entertain the idea of seeing French become more important in the European Union, we would need to see increasing numbers of young people pursuing French in schools uh, during their education. And we are not seeing that. We are seeing an increase in the number of young people who are becoming proficient in English, and we are seeing a decrease in both French and German. Um, Spanish is now a more common foreign language to pursue in schools across the European Union. Spanish has now greater numbers of young people studying their language and French and German, as I've said, are in a slight decline. So um, if one wanted to argue that there was a possibility that uh, French could become a lingua franca for the European apparatus and for the peoples of the European Union, then resources would be needed to increase uh, the number of young people who are studying French. Uh, and there's no possibility uh, uh, for this to happen because the language policies for each member state are not regulated in Brussels. It's an issue which is handled at each member state level. And there, there's simply no support for uh, putting more resources into French, whereas there is great support for increasing uh, the numbers of, of uh, uh, resources that are put into English. And this is something which is very much backed up by Erasmus, where we have 
uh, at the university level, we have young people throughout Europe traveling to uh, other member states to study and attending their lectures there in English and in improving their English and not uh, promoting plurilingualism. Now, one could say, well, perhaps we should entertain the idea that German uh, could become uh, the lingua franca and challenge English. And we have 90 million native speakers of, uh, of English, of, of German in the European Union. Uh, so it's by far the largest uh, language for mother tongue users. But among uh, uh, the German people themselves and among uh, the uh, political establishment in Germany, and perhaps to some extent in Austria, we do not see uh, resistance to accepting the fact that English now has this role. On the other hand, we do see resistance uh, to uh, the French moving their positions forward. So what seems to be logical is that if French is to become a more important language in the European Union, then German would also have to become equally more important. Um, and this uh, certainly makes life very difficult for uh, a good hundred million people that speak uh, lesser used minority languages and endangered languages. It's not really um, plausible, if you will, to expect uh, people who speak uh, smaller languages to become proficient in an, in an L3 in order to be able to operate uh, in Europe, in, in, in order to be able to communicate with the European Union, they would always be at a disadvantage interacting with speakers of uh, larger European languages, such as French uh, and German. Now, um, one argument that has been put forth is that English perhaps um, should not have this position as a procedural language or a language used in the European Union for the simple reason that there is no longer a member state that has English as its official language. Uh, uh, Ireland, as we know, the Republic of Ireland has chosen uh, their, their Celtic uh, language and Malta has chosen Maltese. It's also the case that we don't have uh, native speakers of English on the continent in any large numbers. Roughly 1% of the European Union has English as a native tongue. A, a little more than 1% are native speakers of English and they are found in the Republic of Ireland. So, uh, if one then said, well, we don't have a nation state any longer, a member state any longer, which has English as their official EU language, then English should be out. Uh, that is not possible because that requires a, 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 a voting in the council, which is unanimous. And the Irish have made it very clear that they would not go along with that, which means that despite the fact that English does not have a member state with English as the the official language. English is nevertheless an official language of the European Union and one of the three procedural languages. Now, um, moving forward, uh, I want to express criticism for the idea that we have three procedural languages. Uh, the first reason is because it has no real effect. Uh, Across the European Union, people are using English. Uh, people are using English in the agencies, they're using English in the parliament, they're using English in the council. And it is the case now that you must know English to work for the European, the European Union. So the practical reality of what is going on in the European Union is that English is the working language of the European Union. It is, it has that status. French and German are not used to any great extent. The idea that you have these three procedural languages really no longer has any meaning. It also is um, negative for other larger European languages. For example, Italian. Italian has 65 million speakers who have Italian as a native tongue. And it is not one of these three procedural languages. It is not fair uh, to speakers of Spanish or Polish or Romanian, or for that matter, Dutch. Um, why is it the case that 
just French and German have this special role, which is ceremonial, really. Not, it, we don't see it being used very much any longer, not since the enlargements um, in the early uh, uh, years of this, of this millennium. So if we were to say that all languages of the European Union are working languages and can be used at our discretion, then we would be honoring other languages besides French and German. And it will change nothing in terms of practice. It will simply be a way of creating a more fair atmosphere for deciding what languages are going to be used at meetings or between individuals working for the European Union. It is also the case that what English brings to the table, uh, if you will, is fairness. Everyone in the European Union, with the exception of a few people in, in Malta and, and the Republic of Ireland, would be using a foreign language. Everyone would be using an L2. And this would create a situation where no one has an advantage over others because they are native speakers of the language which is being used. And this would make life much easier, if you will. Much, it would be much easier for people to feel comfortable as members of the European Union if they felt that when they were interacting uh, with the European Union, that they were doing it on a level playing field. Everyone would be using a language which to them is an L2, or if you will, perhaps an L3. So this is the strongest argument, if you will, uh, for uh, accepting the fact that English has become the universal lingua franca of the peoples of the European Union, as well as of the EU apparatus. And I know that there is resistance to this. I know that there are people who um, lament the fact that this has, has, has become a reality. But we must remember that it is not necessarily the case that Britain uh, being a member of the U European Union was the reason why English became so important in mainland Europe. We must remember that English is the global lingua franca. It's the language which we use to communicate with people from throughout the world. If it was the case that we had a lingua franca for Europe, which was not English, this would then require that Europeans must be proficient in three languages, one of them of which is English. Now that of course is always a possibility, but not practical and in all likelihood not going to happen. And this is because people who have put a tremendous amount of resources into learning English are going to be resistant if they're told that they now must become plurilingual in order to be in order to efficiently work within the EU. So what we are going to see um, as, a, as a result of these developments is not increasing plurilingualism, but increasing bilingualism. And there's every reason to believe that within uh, the next uh, 10 to 15 years, the vast majority of people in the European Union are going to be bilingual and their L2, many of them, a very large number of them, their L2 is going to be English. Then we're going to have people who are plurilingual and they will have other uh, important European languages such as French and German and Spanish as their L3. Now, um, when you have a political entity which is using a language for a number of very important domains, such as government, education, information, culture, diplomacy, business, aviation, sports, the list goes on and on. When you have a language which is dominant in a large number of important domains, then what takes place as that language is widely used in cross-cultural communication is that the language goes through processes of nativization. That is to say, there are particular characteristics of the usage of the lingua franca, which differ from the standard versions of the language as they have been codified in native speaker communities. Now, uh, for Europe, 
uh, what we have seen uh, in the last 50 years is a reliance on the British English model in education. And this had its high moment, if you will, in the 1960s and 1970s, where learning English meant learning British English. And you were learning British English in order to communicate with people from Great Britain or native speakers from other nation states. So learners in Europe were being asked to assume multi-identities to impersonate a native speaker of English, preferably one uh, who was speaking an educated version of English as it is spoken um, among the middle classes and upwards in the UK. Uh, this idea that, that uh, one uh, could acquire English by learning about the institutions of, of Britain, by learning about British culture, by trying to mimic proficient speakers of British English, this idea continued to have a, a hold on language education in Europe throughout the 20th century. And we did not see uh, changes really uh, until the beginning of, of this century. One of the reasons um, I believe personally is uh, the advent of satellite television, the idea that people could watch um, television, which was uh, uh, sent from other places, very often in English, things like uh, MTV and CNN and so on. People started having exposure to much more media um, in native speaking, native speaker English, which was from other places besides Britain, if you will. That began um, uh, in, the, in the 1980s and, and moved forward rather, rather rapidly. But what really changed things is information technology, the use of the personal computer, the internet. And um, in uh, 2005, 2010, 2015, with the explosion of young people playing computer games and so on, um, social media and so on, uh, what we saw was very quickly uh, people abandoning, attempting to mimic the British English model and moving over to speak something which was more similar to American English. This has taken place in Northern Europe more than in, in Central and, and Southern Europe, but it is now recognizable throughout Europe. It is <laughs> recognizable, as a matter of fact, even in the UK, that we have a linguistic Americanization taking place in the L2 English, which is spoken by by Europeans. Now, why would I want to have a conversation about how the English which Europeans are speaking is becoming Americanized? Um, the reason, uh, the argument, if you will, is that I do not believe that it is in the best interests of the European Union for us to continue to feel that we must mimic the British when we speak English. I don't think that that supports the idea of a European identity. But I would feel even more strongly if Europe wanted to have American English as the model for education. Um, within uh, the Anglo-American sphere of influence, we have behaviors and values, practices, and so on, which are not mainland European. They do not reflect the mainland European sensibility. So within the field of social linguistics, we have the notion of the second language variety. Uh, the idea that when a language is used in a region, most often a, a, a nation state, that as it gains more and more importance in more and more domains, and as we see uh, systems of, of uh, systematicity, uh, it evolves into what we call a second language variety and takes on its own prescriptive grammar. This is something which has been uh, widely studied in places like India and Nigeria, uh, Singapore as well. So, we call this processes of nativization, where specific aspects of language, which is not commonly used among native speaker communities, 
become recognized as features of that variety of English. Now, um, this raises the question then, um, is there such a thing as a European English? I personally believe that there is. Then the question becomes, well, does it have regional variation? The answer is yes, it does most certainly have regional variation just as British English and American English have regional variation. So within the European Union, we have things like the Italian accent. Uh, we had a very uh, lovely example of that in our conversations before we began uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have French, the French accent, we have the German accent and so on. And these would be regional features. Now, what is European English or European Englishes? What is that? What does that entail? One of the most uh, uh, common ways of, of, of witnessing what is happening to the English as it's spoken by L2 users in mainland Europe is in the study of words, of lexical items. And we were looking at words which are European in origin, which do not exist in native speaker varieties and which are easily recognized uh, among, among people in Europe. Uh, one very interesting example of this is the term member state. Now, why do we use the term member state in Europe? And I think that there's a reason. First of all, it is an example of European English. We don't use the word member state in American or British English. And thus we're talking about the European Union. And we know about the European Union. So the term member state suggests something different than the idea which exists in the United States where you have states, uh, 50 states that make up uh, uh, America as it's conceptualized. The idea of the member state is, um, I don't know if we wanna conceptualize Europe as a federation or one thing I know we don't want to do is we don't wanna call it a country. Um, and so we come up with other words that are polite. For me, the European Union is a country. The reason why I say this is because laws passed in Brussels supersede the laws which are passed in Stockholm. Now on my passport, it says I'm a citizen of the European Union. That to me sounds like a nation state. Now, I know there are people, Euroskeptics, who are unhappy when they hear people like me say these things but I am a staunch supporter of the European Union. I believe very strongly in the European Union. And I'm honored that we are moving in the direction of unification. Now, the issues which we're talking about today, the idea of uh, English taking on its own characteristics, being recognized as the English of Europe, is actually not a political issue. It's something which happens naturally when people use an, a language extensively. It's happening naturally in Brussels in something that they call Eurospeak, which is radical slang, um, if you will, uh, nativization, um, transference of features coming uh, primarily out of French and German, a kind of English which is almost incomprehensible to many native speakers. That is not what we mean when we talk about Euro English. That is, you know, anytime you have features which are esoteric, which are not clearly understood widely in the speech community, then that is not promoting the idea of cross-cultural communication. So Euro-English would include features which are widely understood. Um, and there are many, there are many articles written about this. It's very easy to get a hold of material which charts the kinds of things that Europeans are doing in pronunciation, in the use of lexical items, in grammar, and so on, which are distinctly European and, and can be seen as markers of identity. Now, um, if we continue then with this discussion of, uh, of European English on an ideological level, um, we would want then to uh, entertain the idea that in some way we must go forward with this because not doing anything, being incapable of acting 
will make it possible for American English to make further gains. And the reason for this is, uh, is uh, economic. Um, it has to do with uh, promoting um, intellectual properties, movies, films, television, Netflix, and so on and so forth. All of these, all of these aspects of Anglo-American culture, which are promoted in the medium of English, are increasing in our daily lives in mainland Europe. So if we do nothing to address what kind of English we want to have as the standard in education and in the European Union, in European Union documentation, if we do nothing, then what we will see is an increase in the influence of American English. That is the reason why I believe that it is time now that we must take action. It's also the case that there are remnants of influence from British English um, in the European Union. So at the current time, the official guidelines for documentation, for using the English language in documents in the EU, the official document claims that British English is the EU standard. And this is something that came about when Britain was still in the EU. At that time, of course, there was no argument that British English was the European standard. And the reason for this is, is very clear, very easy to understand. Um, it would not be possible to tell the British, as long as they were members of the European Union, that their language standard wasn't the standard for English in the EU. It simply would not be possible. Um, it would be like telling the French that they can't have Parisian French as a standard or, or telling the Swedish that they can't have Riksvenska as the standard for Swedish. It's just not possible. But Britain has left the European Union. They are no longer involved in European unification. And for that reason, I do not understand why we would want their linguistic behavior, their behavior when they speak English, to be the standard for Europe. It makes no sense whatsoever to me, none whatsoever. I, I, in earlier work, I said that I did not believe that British nationals would be working in the translation and interpretation services in the, in the European Union for the simple reason that they were no longer European citizens. And I have been criticized for this. People said, oh, well, you know, they'll just get another passport. Uh, they're more than welcome, you know, to become citizens of Luxembourg or any number of places. And they, and British nationals can continue regulating the English, which Europeans use. Uh, and, uh, this is, of course, a possibility, uh, but I do not feel that this is something which is beneficial if it is the case that these people have a political agenda. If their purpose with uh, translating is to promote British English, which I do not believe is in the best interest of Europe, then this is something which needs to be addressed. Somebody said, well, where are we going to get people to work in the translation services? You know, well, the Irish, who are native speakers of English, are members of the European Union. If we're going to uh, hire foreigners, we can hire people from Australia or New Zealand or Canada or the United States. Why would the British have any special position here? There's another reason for this reluctance to um, see influence coming from British English in the European Union. And that is that we have linguistic chauvinism not only in, 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 in British English, but also in French, where we see people being highly critical if somebody doesn't use the language in a manner that that person feels is appropriate. Now that whole attitude of having um, uh, things to say about how people use English in Europe belongs to the past. Europe is now the European Union is now a fraternity of people who have English as a foreign language. We are not native speakers. And if it is the case that we want to make it possible for nativization processes to go forward and to recognize and accept the fact that some of us see the English which we speak as European English, then we must move away from any forms of uh, linguistic chauvinism where people make fun of others for the way they use English or, or laugh at their mistakes. 
uh, or do the kinds of things which we've seen in the press over the last 40 or 50 years. That must come to an end. English belongs to Europe. It is our language. We define what is right and wrong in the English which we speak. So as you can see, um, there will be people who feel that they want to learn and speak British English, and those people should be supported in that endeavor. There will also be people who will want to pursue American English uh, in their studies. But the European English project, the idea is that it will be a, legi a legitimate choice that can be made. In other words, if young people in school say, well, we want to learn European English, then that should be something that they can choose. Now, what will that actually mean in the instruction? One of the things is that uh, what young people would be doing is they would learn how to use English to discuss the European Union. They would study the institutions in Brussels. They would study the European Union, the way it is comprised, the way regulations change our way of life and so on and so forth. Because that is what they will be explaining to people they meet outside of Europe. They, they will talk about their home country. They will talk about their own cultures. They will talk about the countries in which they live in, the member states in which they live in. They, won't, they don't need to be trained to talk about the culture of Britain and America to, to speak good English. That idea, that antiquated idea that learning English means that you have to acquire trivial information about the American government or, or the government of Britain in, in, in London, that belongs to the past. Young people in, in the European Union today speaking English as a foreign language need an English which allows them to speak about their identity, their role in the world as Europeans. So this is a, a larger program, if you will, which crosses, um, uh, which crosses school education, which crosses regulations uh, concerning documentation within the European Union, and which addresses the issue of European identity. Now, uh, I've been asked many times whether or not I feel that, that European English exists. Um, and my answer is always, yes, most certainly. I do believe that there is something called European English. Um, it is an English which is obviously not a native speaker. It is an English where uh, the people express themselves with an accent that gives us an indication of where they come geographically. And it is, um, it is an expression of European identity. And I recognize this, I meet people constantly where I, I listen to the way they're speaking and I, and I realize they, they did not work to attain near native proficiency in a, a prestigious native tongue language. Um, and I tip my hat to that. And they are comfortable with their use of English, with their identity in English. And they represent themselves for who they truly are. Now this uh, conceptualization of language learning in the European Union, when it pertains to English, because English is a lingua franca, is something which I believe uh, the, are the leaders of the EU in Brussels need to address. They've been um, um, reluctant to take up these issues for decades, pretending as if English is not making gigantic gains in a number of important domains. Every year, more and more English and other European languages being compromised as a result. And one of the things that I think is absolutely amazing is that one of the arguments has been, well, we can put money into Erasmus Plus. We can promote uh, 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 young, young people, students uh, studying abroad, studying in other member states. We can promote researchers and teachers traveling to other European countries to work, to give lectures, to teach. I myself have uh, 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 given lectures at uni universities as an Erasmus exchange many times. And what I uh, have discovered, which is no secret, um, is that Erasmus promotes English. What happens in universities that want to enlarge their Erasmus uh, program is that they immediately begin offering courses in English, many of which are attended by their own students. And they bring in students very often at the master's level and the teachers speak English. And the young people traveling to that country never learn 
another language. What they do learn is that English has a great deal of utility, that English is a very important language. And this makes them more convinced to be bilingual. They may start asking themselves the question, why should I pursue a third language when English has such, such utility? Now, um, of course, this was not the intention of Erasmus, but the result of Erasmus is that in higher education, English is much more important than it would have been without Erasmus. I do not think this is a good thing. I think that Erasmus needs to be rethought and that what we should do instead is have programs where young people study the language of the host university before they go and attend, language, uh, attend lectures in the language of the host university so that Erasmus students truly promote plurilingualism. Now this might be impossible in some advanced uh, programs uh, in the hard sciences, uh, so PhD programs and so on. Um, but if we make some effort to have Erasmus truly promote plurilingualism, that will mean that those resources aren't going to English. I think that what we need to do in the European Union is we need to pull back on promoting English. We need to have less funding for English as we go forward and redirect those monies to all of the languages of, of Europe, but especially uh, lesser used minority and endangered languages. Now, the reason why I, I say that I think we need to stop putting resources into English is because a monumental amount of resources are going into English anyway through uh, business, through private concerns, through the media, through the internet, through film production and, and television production. That's going to continue regardless of what we do. English is going to increase in importance in Europe regardless of what we do. So I see no reason why we should be promoting something which is having a negative effect our, on our indigenous languages. The, the, the advance of English in the European Union is having a negative effect on all European languages, on the, on the lexical register, the words which we use. Um, and we also see atrophy. We see languages becoming less important in many domains. And this as well is something which has not been addressed by the European Union. The threat which English is, is making, especially on minority languages and and, and, and endangered languages. We need to put more money into all of the languages in Europe and less money into, into English. Now, uh, uh, finally, um, I, I just wanna say a few words, um, if you will, about where we're going, what the statistics indicate. Every year, about 5 million people come into this world uh, in the European Union and about 5 million people leave this world. Um, there's 450 million people, as I've said. And that means that in just 10 years, there are 50 million people that did not see the light of day today. In 10 years from now, 50 million new souls will be citizens of the, of the European Union. They will live and experience the world through English. Now, what this means is that within 15 or 20 years, virtually everyone who has education, who has access to, to, to high school, the gymnasium, to university studies, they will know English. It is a requirement in most countries in Europe to have English in order to graduate from university. So if we know that we're moving toward a situation where English is becoming more and more important, we know that it already dominates the European Union, then why is it the case that we're doing nothing to protect the indigenous languages of Europe? Why is it the case that no one is making provisions so that we recognize English as a, as a lingua franca and do away with this conflict, which is not productive, uh, where people are, 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 are using their elbows to be a procedural language? And it's only ceremonial, ceremonial as I've said, because what people are doing is they're speaking English anyway, regardless of what 
uh, people say about procedural languages. If English is going to be a lingua franca for Europe, then we should claim the language and make it our own and not take directives from native speakers in Britain and America as to what is good English or bad English, what is right or wrong. Um, all of these things are inevitable. We will not be able to go forward without having to deal with English. Ignoring it only makes the situation worse. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. So I open the floor for uh, questions. <clears throat> and while we wait for questions, just uh, I take the chance to ask the one. So the, the European project is uh, an, an, an accomplished uh, project. And uh, the intuition here is that uh, possibly a further advancement in this project do require uh, enhancing the awareness about uh, our European identity. And the, the question here is uh, whether uh, full language integration in terms of uh, the emergence of uh, European English can help in this, uh, in this process. And then uh, what would be the practical steps then indeed to okay. achieve our- Okay, well, this, this is an extremely difficult question to answer um, because uh, it is already the case that Europe has chosen English and it is now moving forward uncontrolled. Um, but one could turn the question around and say, well, any language, if we decided to have a language, uh, what would be the processes of making it um, a viable lingua franca? Well, the answer is that you have to spend a lot of money educating people to speak that language. All of the um, Math, all the math that we've done, all the calculations that we've done indicate that it would be far, far more expensive to use any other language than English. So from an economic point of view, it's already the case. Um, as I said earlier, because of globalization, it's really not possible to not choose English. But if we decided to claim English and have a European English and go in that direction, then the first step must be that this is something which is recognized by the European Union. Then what would follow is that each member state would have to take a position. And I believe that if the European Union goes forward and shows leadership, that the member states will recognize that this is an important project and that they will, first of all, take measures to protect indigenous languages and then allow for, uh, the European English project to go forward so that people can have that as a choice. They can choose British English, they can choose American English, they can choose European English. And then in time, it is the peoples of the European Union which will determine what comes of this. So that, that is my opinion that somebody has to take a stand. Simon. Yeah, to Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marco, I have a question for you. I, I really uh, enjoyed uh, a lot of that. And in fact, I, in the chat function, I've sent you an article by a link to an article by me where I discussed a related point. But there was one part of your talk which uh, uh, mirrored something I said. I mean, it repeated something I said, which was about the now Britain free EU. It's like yeah. uh, 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 You talked about the Brit Britain no longer in the EU. Um, yeah. But uh, when you discussed that, uh, you took it in a slightly different direction to me because, or at least when I was talking about Macron, uh, which was, uh, you seem to assume that Britain would never be in the EU ever again. And, oh, and, oh, and so, oh. uh, like you were saying, well, you know, they're not in the EU, so we've got to go in this direction. Oh, okay. Maybe. All right. <laughs> you want, all right. You want to do that? Let's do that. Okay, Simon, you guys left the field. You moved out. You took your furniture with you. You said you didn't want to be married to us anymore, and we had a divorce. Yeah. If you come back, you're going to have to take the Ebro. If you come back, you're going to have to play our game according to our rules, and you're not willing to do that. Yet. Well, I'm sorry, Simon. I don't see it in my lifetime. 
I d- it doesn't matter if it's in yours. I don't think it would be in mine either. But that's I want like, you just to the, know, the basic character of your argument was suggesting that history is over. Back. They're not coming back. I want you to know, <laughs> Simon, that the day Britain left the European Union was a sad day. Well, you're not kidding. It was a sad moment in European history. And I'm emotionally moved by this in, in, in a way that is not, not a good thing. But if we look at this pragmatically, if Europe wants to be integrated, then England is going to have to make concessions to come back, not Europe. Oh, no, I totally agree with that. I, was, yeah. I wasn't, I was yeah. just thinking that there were parts of your argument which sounded like you were yeah. assuming that it would be forever. And well, what is, is forever. forever? Okay, what is forever? A long time. Well, there are going to be time. 50 million new people in uh, okay. 10 right. years' time. That's... <laughs> All right. All right. If you, if you say to me that you can imagine Britain accepting the Evro, I'll say to you, I can imagine Britain coming back to the EU. Yeah, sure. All right, then we're in agreement. Yeah, but it was part of your argument that they were I understand. Were out. No, I feel that way. But, but you are correcting me, and I stand corrected. Okay. Uh, Cla- Claudio, there was a question earlier in the uh, from the um, from yes. the attenders, yes, which I, the, I was quite the, the, quite keen the, for for us to go back to, and it also relates to some of the things that Marco was talking about. Do you want to read it out? Yeah, unfortunately, the question has uh, it's not any longer in the in the Q and A. Uh, uh, I can tell you what I it guess. said. Do, do, can you see it? Oh no, no, yes, I can see it now. Apo- apologies. So. Uh, how will the European plurality of path be preserved with climate change and sustainability transition plans? That's it. And, and, and Marco, uh, plurality of paths wasn't something insignificant in your discussion too, because of the, as it were, the varieties of English that will develop. But um, perhaps in the wider point, uh, when I was talking about um, possible futures for the European project, which were, uh, as it were, holding short as both Kant and Nietzsche did from the idea of a European government where uh, nation state governments would merely be implementing authority. Um, I quoted Tony Blair at one point talking about um, cooperating in our mutual interests. And uh, another Prime Minister of Britain talked about the willing and active cooperation between in- independent states to speak with a single voice, to pool or share sovereignty where things could be done better together than alone. And I think that that idea of um, unified action, agree, uh, uh, coming together to agree on things that uh, they can't do alone, climate change is an absolutely spectacular example of that, where nation states acting independently can only do so much and the international agreements uh, cooperation in our mutual interest is certainly uh, the way forward there so i would um to, in in response to that question on climate change the plurality of paths uh meet at so many points i mean that's the whole point as it were of a union is that you act together in in conditions of solidarity and um mutual interest but it's the idea of a mutual interest rather than a single interest, as it were, that, that belongs inside that plurality idea. So you don't have a, an elimination of the formula, ever closer union of the peoples. Peoples remains, as it were, in its plurality in that condition. And I, I can't personally see a, a possible future of, of the EU with or without Britain in which plurality simply disappears like that. Can I just say a few words here? Um, what we are seeing, of course, is in, with, within the context of globalization, is that there, there's every reason to cooperate. And if you know, we're talking about Europe, well, certainly cultural and, and economic uh, issues are extremely important. But because of events in just the last few months, now security has become extremely important. So there's every reason in the world for us to be united uh, against our common challenges. The English language, for one reason or another, has been chosen by people as the medium that they use 
uh, when they communicate with people from other cultures. And, and this is just something that has taken place. You know, I think that it's globalization more than anything else. So the cooperation that you're talking about is not only European, but it's also Europeans cooperating with people from throughout the world. And the medium which is being chosen there is English. So it, it kind of becomes a natural conclusion to draw that we're going to be moving more and more into using English for cross-cultural communication and that we don't want it to be owned by native speakers like you and me, <laughs> but by people who actually use the language as an L2 because that's, that's their reality. What, what uh, I, I like so much in that, Marco, and, and it, in fact, it is exactly the argument of the article that I sent to you in the chat. Oh, is, lovely, um, lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, is that the, what I call anglobalization, mm -hmm. that globalization of, uh, or a worldwideization of, of English as a language. First of all, it has exactly that character you described, which is um, localization going in hand in hand with globalization. It's super important fact to remember, uh, but also that um, while it stands in some ways as a sort of threat, because it's a sort of, you, you can understand it as a, a culturally diminishing moment, uh, also a, a sort of cultural hegemony insofar as languages have sort of almost axiomatic structures of uh, forms of uh, belief formation and so on. Um, but it, so in some ways a threat, but in other ways a chance. And the great chance that uh, any language that functions in the position that you describe um, is that it enables uh, communication between peoples, people and peoples who, that would otherwise be impossible. Right. Right. That, that somebody can go along and speak in another place, in another country with another language, and they can speak together. And what a remarkable thing that is, wonderful thing. Like it's a cosmopolitical reality. And uh, I think that bulking at English as the medium for this is like a bit like Nietzsche saying you can't resist democracy. You know, what, a, what a pointless thought, let's resist democracy. You could yeah. equally say, let's resist and globalization. Yeah. It's a yeah, fact. I mean, trying to stop English is like saying we, we don't want to have winter, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so let's not have winter any longer. English is inevitable. It is a historic inevitability. Yeah. Because it has such mass at the moment, it can no longer be stopped. So my argument is that knowing that, then let's move away from native speaker hegemony. Let's stop allowing native speakers to make us feel as if our English isn't, isn't adequate as one point among many in their effort to make us feel inadequate. Because, <laughs> I mean, it is an issue of neocolonialism. Right, right. I mean, there is no doubt about it that if we don't if we don't recognize this, then we'll you know we'll wind up lion dancing with cowboy hats. No. And I'm not joking. It, there's places in Sweden where you can go and lion dance, and they play cowboy music. And I know that they're doing the same thing in Italy. And, and they're this, doing it in know, Britain too. Oh, sure. So this, I mean, there's there's one thing when these things are cute and fun. But there's another, it's another thing when it becomes dominant and the indigenous cultures and traditions take a back seat. You know, the end of time, if you will, is when you have people in mainland Europe raising their children as native speakers, people yeah. in families speaking English to their children. When that moment comes, that will be the end of European culture. You know, there's an, another dimension to this, Marco, uh, which neither of us touched on, and I, uh, I guess neither of us were invited to, but it, your, your la the language of nativization that you use reminded me uh, that um, the 50 million people who you described as be being, well, who will be around uh, in, in the next 10 years, um, they'll be digital natives too, mm. right? And so you have a, a, a transformation of the space that's technological as well as linguistic. Mm. And we don't know how dramatic that will be and, and whether it will be far more overwhelming culturally, socially. Than, it's overwhelming uh, now for people who have teenagers. Oh, I've seen it. I've got them. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> actually mine are, mine are too old now to be. Yeah, they walk around that. like this with their phone in their face. Well, yeah. that, that's not just teenagers, man. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes, um, I mean, there, there, I've seen some interesting uh, writing on 
problems with nativization. Actually, uh, Nietzsche writes about some something similar when he uh, before it even came about. But um, digital natives uh, are a bit sometimes a bit like um, the children in um, Lord of the Flies. They're sort of released from structures of uh, social networks which provide us a kind of organizing space for existence and that's not necessarily a good thing i mean we all well, become sort of short, yeah, gl gl short form listeners and readers yeah gladly within the uh, discipline of linguistics it's much less dramatic <laughs> anyway something to be to think about and, and also i mean uh, in terms of europe of course uh, claudio's uh, webinar here uh, is the sort of event which would have been impossible uh, I don't know how recently you know uh, 15 years ago it would have been remarkable to hold, hold these sorts of things now they're every day and they're good and for the environment well they are we're not on a plane yeah uh, but but they're also good I mean we're also speaking in English um, so it has those features of, of that uh, so you and I are agents of linguistic imperialism. No, not necessarily. No, because they, you, you actually you said that the uh, uh, without any native English speakers around, there will still be in English. Oh, sure, sure. Right. No, I was so, being facetious. Yeah. So you, not, okay. Obviously, yes. <laughs> yeah. Claudio is un, unmuted. So. Yeah. Yes, so I was just uh, seeing another question, but it's not a question, it's just uh, uh, Anastasia is she's, uh, pointing out uh, her research work in, uh, in related, in related um, issues, I, I believe. Uh -huh. Okay, so I think uh, we have uh, also exhausted our time. Oh, and, so we have. Yes, so I would like to thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your uh, <clears throat> your talks and uh, bye bye to everybody okay thanks very much bye 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 marco